Um, so the invisible wounds of war um, refer to a set of clinical conditions, um, typically mild traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress disorder is the main ones, um, but also depression, substance abuse. So these are, are things that are affecting individuals where just by looking at someone, you can't tell that there's an issue there. So that's why we refer to them as invisible wounds. And when we think about trauma in the military setting, there's kind of physical trauma and you know, we've been focused more on traumatic brain injury. And we'll talk about severe traumatic brain injury, so that's in your death type of situation, um, where there's obvious outward signs of the traumatic event, moderate traumatic brain injury, and then the real concern in the current conflict is mild traumatic brain injury, particularly that that might be associated with blast exposures, where just by looking at someone, you can't see that anything's wrong. And in fact, even by traditional cognitive testing and traditional brain imaging, you often can't tell that something's wrong. But these individuals tell you that they have memory problems, attention problems, executive control problems. So we're in this situation where either they just don't know how to tell us their problems or they're making them up, or there's something really going on here but we don't have the right tools and technologies to find out what that is. And I personally fall in that last camp there. And so our research has been focused on developing behavioral tools, brain, image, brain imaging tools, mostly MRI based, and electrophysiological tools that let us look at what's happening in the brain of these individuals and see if there are brain abnormalities that correlate with their subjective complaints. So, so this really is a huge problem. So the, the U.S. has deployed um, about two million service members to the Mideast. Um, but estimates from the RAND Corporation are that somewhere between 20 and 35 percent of these individuals will show one of these invisible wounds. Again, PTSD and traumatic, mild traumatic brain injury being the most prominent ones. Well, that translates into 400,000 individuals affected by these conditions. And we not only need to worry about them, but their immediate families, their extended families. So when you think about how large a population is ultimately going to be impacted by this, we are talking about well over a million individuals that either directly or peripherally are impacted by this. And that's a real national health crisis. It goes beyond just DOD. It goes beyond the VA. We really need how to figure out to get DOD, VA, academic medical centers, and also community-based hospitals to partner together, to put into place a national strategy on how we're going to identify individuals that need help and how we're going to implement helping. So, so, so outside of the box is really important here. Um, many of our current service members aren't very comfortable at VA hospitals. They view VA hospitals, that's where the Vietnam guys went, the Korea guys went, it's not where we want to go. We want to stay home with our families. We want to access services more where we live than having to, to trudge, you know, 50, 100 miles to get to a VA hospital. Um, and quite frankly, the numbers are so big, it's going to overwhelm the VA system. If we can't figure out how to get some first line tools in the hands of counselors and even primary care docs for just recognizing when somebody is at risk, we're going to have problems. So, so if we're going to develop and implement effective treatments, first thing is we've got to know what we're dealing with. We have to understand who has what. We've got to find ways to essentially visualize these wounds. So we can say, does this guy have depression or PTSD or TBI? Or more commonly, a combination. So there's tremendous comorbidity across these conditions. So the first thing is visualizing. We've got to understand how they interact. The way that you treat PTSD in the absence of TBI 
may be very different from what you have to do if somebody has both conditions. And ultimately, we've got to understand the relevant neurobiology because that's what's going to help us develop effective treatments. If I can understand what's happened in the brain, chemistry, physiology, structure, function, then I can start to think about appropriate pharmacological interventions, appropriate cognitive-based therapies. We're in a bit better shape for PTSD. We have some tools that are pretty effective there. Um, mild TBI is really challenging. We have very, very little in terms of our treatment abilities right now. We don't have medications specifically developed for TBI. We don't have great cognitive behavioral rehab strategies, and that's in part because we don't quite understand the disorder yet. So if we can understand what's going on, then we can develop better targeted treatments. Well, so one of the reasons that traditionally people have questioned the existence of mild TBI is that in fact the majority of individuals with a mild TBI, well they have some symptoms for the first week or maybe the first few weeks, three, four months out they really are symptom free. Um, we often refer to the 10 to 20 percent that have persistent symptoms as the miserable minority because, again, we've got no objective evidence that they have symptoms. They just tell us that they have symptoms. And so we have no treatment strategies. It's frustrating for them. It's frustrating for healthcare providers. It's frustrating for researchers. One of the things that imaging technologies, physiological technologies, and also animal models are telling us is that even in these mild, even these individuals with only mild concussions, there's now mounting evidence that yes, there really is brain damage. But it's still a debate. So the symptoms of PTSD, some of the cognitive symptoms, very closely resemble some of the things that are reported by individuals with mild TBI. And so DOD, unfortunately, has been kind of doing this flip-flop. It's all TBI, it's all PTSD, and it's a combination of both. Both of them are real. We need to understand why do some people show mild TBI symptoms and other individuals don't. Um, we believe it has to do with something known, um, that's referred to as cognitive reserve. Um, so the ability of the brain to reorganize in the face of, of damage, and that's a variable from people to people, and people with low cognitive reserve don't have that ability to compensate for when their neurons get damaged. So they are more likely to show symptoms after even only a mild injury. But you know, my belief is that this is real. We need to treat it as real. We need to do a better job of getting techniques that prove it's real, and they have to work on an individual basis. Um, research showing group differences is valuable for the first step, but we've got to start to move towards diagnostic abilities, and we're not there yet. The PTS treatments are really come in two categories. So um, pharmacological treatments, um, in particular the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so a lot of the antidepressant, anti-anxiety medications work there. It's kind of treating the symptoms of the PTSD that seems to work. Um, there is a medication, and I'm blocking on its name, um, that shows some specific efficacy um, relative to nightmares for PTSD. So pharmacological management is part of it. The second part of it is more on the psychological side of things, and there are kind of um, three parts to that. Um, one part really is cognitive behavioral and exposure therapy. So exposure therapy, in essence, reveals bringing up the traumatic event again, but in a physical situation that's no longer threatening. And that aids with extinction of the condition fear response. So um, exposure therapies are one of our most powerful tools. Um, general um, adjunctive therapies to do things like just reduce and deal with stress reactions. So anger management, um, mindfulness, um, those are all an important part of this. Um, and then the, the last part really, I believe, is education helping individuals understand that this really is biological. It's, it's not their fault that they got this. There's something in their biology that, that has resulted in this. And supporting and educating family members on this. Um, 
I'm a, a very strong believer that it's not just about treating the individual person. We need to treat at least educate the family unit because their ability to support this individual is going to be critical for a successful outcome. Imaging toolkit is a little bit different for PTSD than it is for TBI. So for, for PTSD, um, the technologies that are bearing the most promise in terms of understanding um, some of the core biology are the functional imaging methods. So things like functional MRI, um, electrophysiological methods, um, magnetoencephalography, electroencephalography. The combination of those techniques along with some of the older standbys like PET imaging are really helping us to understand what circuitry is disrupted in these individuals, um, gives us targets, um, particularly for pharmacological intervention, but also by understanding the circuitry, we can understand the cognitive deficits and say, okay, there's a memory problem here, and it's part of extinction of memory. So exposure therapy is potentially a good strategy there. Um, in traumatic brain injury, in TBI, um, those same technologies are valuable there. Um, diffusion tensor imaging and tractography, um, really looking at the interconnections between brain regions, I think are gonna, is going to be very important. Um, another technology, um, MR spectroscopy, which looks at um, metabolism and biochemistry in the brain, I think is also going to play an important role in TBI. But TBI really is a harder problem because of the tremendous variability from individual to individual. And I think that we really do need to increase our efforts on animal models where we can actually do before and after testing and we've got some control over the actual exposure. So, so the, the military healthcare conferences um, really serve two purposes. Um, they are a way for individuals like myself to inform military physicians about the emerging science, um, what we're learning on the neurobiology, and how down the road that is going to impact their treatment strategies. Um, the value to individuals like myself who are more on the research side than the clinical treatment side is we do a lot of research in this country on biological and psychiatric disease where the investigators doing the research have never actually seen a patient that has the condition that they are researching. And science doesn't work that well in a vacuum. Um, the translation needs to go both ways. So as a scientist, I need to understand what are the real problems that the clinicians are having in terms of the management of these individuals. Because by understanding the clinical profile, it helps me formulate the right research questions. It lets me do research that's not science for science sake. It's science for getting an answer that's going to help individuals.